This video was created in partnership with Bill Gates, inspired by his new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. Smokestacks, tailpipes, and smog. These are the images commonly associated with climate change, and for good reason. We are currently pumping 51 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere every year. But there's another climate change image to consider. It's water. We need it to live, fish need it to swim, and baby ducks need it to look absolutely adorable. Billions of people on planet Earth get fresh, safe drinking water piped into their homes to be used at will. It seems almost magical. You just turn on your tap and out it comes. With most things that seem simple or magic on the user end, it's incredibly complicated behind the scenes. There's the actual engineering behind the water system, the pipes, the pumps, and treatment facilities. And there's the city planning, too. Cities can't grow without an adequate water supply or method of getting the water to everyone. What does municipal water have to do with climate change? Well, providing clean, safe drinking water in urban environments is increasingly challenging thanks to a warming planet. Watershed encroachment, flooding, droughts, and urbanization can all strain urban water systems. Every time we pump another billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere, we're depriving more people of safe, clean drinking water. So stick around to learn about the magic that is municipal water, the challenges in providing it, and the future solutions in the face of climate change. Let's start our deep dive into water by focusing on infrastructure before we get into planning and climate change. Just like nature has a water cycle, so too do urban areas. This video is focused on the half of the urban water cycle over here. We covered the other half in a previous video on this channel. There's a link in the description if you want to check it out. The cycle starts with a source water. This can come from a variety of sources. Most typically, cities get it from freshwater lakes, rivers, or groundwater. That water is piped into a treatment facility. Here, it is pre-treated to get rid of leaves and debris. Then it goes through several more phases of filtration and chemical disinfection to eliminate disease-causing microorganisms. This is why you generally don't hear people getting diseases like cholera in places with treated water. After treatment, the clean water enters the water distribution system, a network of pipes, pumps, and storage facilities. Pumps push water uphill and ensure a constant and appropriate level of water pressure in the pipes. Water towers serve a dual purpose. They can act as clean water storage tanks and also help provide water pressure. They are able to supply pressurized water during a power outage, though not indefinitely, as a powered pump is required to refill the tower. They can be used to provide pressure during peak water and peak power times, and refilled by a pump when the electricity costs are lower. Water towers are one of my favorite pieces of urban infrastructure. I mean, look at how goofy they are doing their very important job. I grew up around the spheroids built by the Chicago Bridge and Iron Company. They loom large over the flatness of the Midwest. And there are some amazing old water towers, and even a few novelty ones as well. What's your favorite water tower? Let me know in the comments. Finally, all of that stored and piped water makes its way into the homes and businesses of the local community. After use, it enters the second half of the urban water cycle, the wastewater system. This complex system is designed by engineers who know exactly the right size pipe to serve a given neighborhood and the chemicals needed to clean that baby duck poop out of the water before it reaches your house. They can diagnose leaks and plan for future growth. Thank you engineers for all the work you do. I've put links to great videos by Grady over at Practical Engineering in the description if you want to learn more about the engineering of the water system. Planning for urban water can be complicated too. Much of this complexity comes from the top of the water cycle. Finding an adequate and safe source of water can be difficult, particularly in the face of urban growth and climate change. And cities concentrate people all in one place, and the world's fresh water may not be organized in that same way. Some cities are better positioned to handle this than others. New York City has one of the most extensive urban water systems in the world, and that water access has allowed it to grow into one of the largest and most influential cities on Earth. It draws its water from three sources, and the largest source is from the Catskill Mountains, over 125 miles from the city. The city's source water has historically been exceptionally high quality, in part because of the strict development restrictions within the watersheds that provide the city's water. New York is also relatively insulated from climate impacts that would affect their water supply, in the medium term at least. But not every city can be lucky enough to have a plentiful, high-quality source of fresh water, or a water tower on top of every building like they have in New York. All you have to do is move to the west coast of the United States to find a completely different water situation. Los Angeles, the largest of the western cities, has had to beg, borrow, and steal water to facilitate its growth over the past 100 years. 
These conflicts are collectively known as the California Water Wars and still continue to this day. It earned the term war from the trickery and lies used by LA water officials to build a 233 mile aqueduct and siphon water from the Owens Valley. The Owens Valley got its water from the snows of the Sierra Nevada mountains, and the farmers in the valley used that water to irrigate crops. Los Angeles bought up land and water rights in the region and essentially took all of the water there. The farmers retaliated by dynamiting the aqueduct, but it was rebuilt and the water now flows into LA taps. If you'd like to learn more about this fascinating story, I'd recommend the book Cadillac Desert by Mark Reisner. LA also relies heavily on the Colorado River for water. The river passes through seven US states and two Mexican states. And by the time the river reaches the Gulf of California, there's no water left. Every drop is accounted for and used in the dry southwestern US and northern part of Mexico. Future growth in Los Angeles will be limited by its access to water. Climate change increases the amount of fresh water that is evaporated, meaning rivers like the Colorado are literally disappearing into thin air. Los Angeles isn't the only city facing the possibility of water shortages. This is already happening right now in many of the world's megacities. If trends continue, by 2050, 5 billion people could be facing water shortages at least once a month. What's causing these shortages besides evaporation? In some cases, a city outgrows its nearby fresh water supply, like Los Angeles. Shortages can also occur as new growth encroaches on the watersheds where the urban area's drinking water comes from. This new development can pollute the streams, lakes, and rivers where the raw drinking water is drawn from. It's not impossible to deal with this quality reduction issue. You just need to build more water treatment facilities. This can work for cities like Los Angeles or New York, wealthy cities in a wealthy country. But cities in developing nations cannot always scale up their water treatment to meet these challenges, and the result is poor water quality. And if the water isn't good to drink, then it's like not having any water at all. And all of that new development in the watershed can prevent rain and runoff from making it into the main water body, again reducing the overall supply. It's critical to protect the entire watershed from encroachment or enact strict land management policies to preserve the quality and quantity of water entering the urban water cycle. Climate change is one challenge facing urban water systems. We're looking at 1.5 to 2 degree increases in global temperatures. Now, that little half degree difference doesn't seem like much, but scientists have run simulations. In many ways, a 2 degree change isn't just 33% worse than a 1.5, it's actually 100% worse. Twice as many people on the planet would have difficulty getting access to clean water. And the way things are going, it looks like we're going to be facing worst case scenarios unless something is done soon. Climate change has obvious effects on supply, but it can also wreak havoc on the water treatment part of the urban water cycle. Rising global temperatures can result in increased herbicide and pesticide use in agriculture, which can leach into source water systems. Algae and microbes can be found in higher quantities too. All of this requires more disinfectant at the treatment stage. If the treatment system is inadequate, pollutants get through. If the system is adequate, there's a risk making the water unhealthy through disinfectant byproducts. But I don't wanna just dwell on the challenges. I wanna harness the positive energy of the water tower and talk about solutions. Solution number one, desalination. One obvious answer to the shortage issue is straightforward. Turn salt water into fresh water. But taking the salt out of salt water requires energy, and using energy to produce clean water could exacerbate climate change, making water shortages more acute. And you can see how this would be a bad cycle to be in. Basically, desalination converts energy into fresh water. If we did have cheap, clean energy though, water shortages would never be a problem because we could desalinate as much as we need. The technology is already there and there are working desalination plants operating now. Solution number two, water conservation. If water supply is dwindling in some areas, individuals in the city can use less water to compensate. This means reducing the amount of water used for watering lawns, for example. Industrial processes can also be reworked to use less water. Density is also the friend of urban water use. You typically see less yard per person in neighborhoods of apartment buildings. Solution number three, growth control measures. Watersheds need protections to preserve the quantity and quality of water. Urban growth boundaries, development moratoriums, and strong land use planning can direct growth away from water sources. These policies will work better in areas with slow or moderate growth, but less so with fast, uncontrolled growth. Megacities and developing nations with informal settlements have had difficulties keeping development out of sensitive watersheds and habitats. And this ignores the entire distribution challenge of providing water to homes and communities built by the residents themselves. 
A combination of these solutions, and perhaps solutions we haven't even thought of yet, will be needed to continue to provide clean water to cities in the face of climate change. It's important to remember that water use essentially equals energy use, so when we talk about water, we're talking about climate change. To get our global emissions from 51 billion tons of CO2 per year down to zero, we're going to need to optimize all aspects of our lives, including our urban water systems. If you're interested in hearing more about solutions to our climate crisis, I'd recommend checking out the book How to Avoid a Climate Disaster by Bill Gates. This video was created in partnership with Bill, and I'm happy to spread the word about all the ways we can work together to avoid a climate disaster. I put a link to the book in the description below. It doesn't go into water towers, but it does tackle important issues like energy, agriculture, and manufacturing. So go check it out.